Each Friday, we bring you something a little bit different, a podcast from the world of security with our very own Jim Tiller. This is Security Bytes. I think we should talk about is the changing business models as well. What used to be a protected environment that you had dominion over is now a wide open environment. Borrowing and lending and your renting technology. Welcome to Security Bytes. A weekly show where we cover interesting cybersecurity news from the week. And then we're joined by a leading cybersecurity expert to discuss today's pressing business and technical challenges of security. Join me, your host, Jim Tiller. Brought to you by and powered by Nash Squared. Let's get started. I'm very excited to introduce to you a very special guest today. She's been the vice president and global sales and channels executive for some of the biggest names in the cybersecurity business. For example, FireEye, Semantic, Tanium, WebSense, IronKey, and Silence, just to name a few. She's a five-time winner of the CRM Channel Chiefs 50 Most Influential and winner of the Power 100 Most Powerful Women of the channel. She's the co-founder of Forte Group, an organization of top women executives in cyber, which actually recently just obtained its 509C status. She advises multiple boards and is deeply involved in M&A and startup activities, and has spent the last three years in venture capital helping founders and investors. Currently, she's the head of platform and community for True Search and executive of strategy and growth for Jupiter One. She's simply an icon and an inspiration to so many in the industry. I give you Dee Dee Dayton. How are you doing, Dee Dee? Hi. Wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the intro. And I'll make one slight okay. edit. I do advise a lot of boards. I don't sit on oh, any. Oh, okay. Uh, we, we did start a board for the Forte Group, which we can talk about a little bit later. Yeah. Very exciting. I'd like to. I'd like mm-hmm. to. It's really exciting. I, I keep very close tabs on how things are happening on LinkedIn as much as humanly possible. You're just so uh, involved in the industry, and uh, it's just so much fun to watch. And, of course, hopefully we get a chance to talk a little bit more about women in cyber um, and, uh, and all the things that are happening there. But with generally within the context of women in cyber, I think, and we were talking about this earlier, is about the role of people and resources in building teams and understanding how to affect security in your organization. And I just want to start by asking you, basically what I'm seeing is a dividing gap between how companies are trying to find what they really need in cyber capability and those who are looking at or are developing or continue down their cybersecurity career and finding a way of connecting those two dots. Today, we have a lot of like certifications. Do you have this certification? I think I need that skill, so I'm going to go for that certification. But then there's so much more to it. So in your world, when it comes to resources, how are you looking at and advising organizations around building strong cybersecurity teams? Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we could parse it into a few different answers. When you look at how industry has changed and when you look at how programs have changed for cybersecurity, excuse me, for cybersecurity, I mean, in the 2000s, you know, everything was about devices, right? Protecting your desktop, protecting your laptop. Applications were fairly simple, client-server relationships, and, you know, everyone was concerned about instant messenger, um, and so in terms of, you know, the types of attacks you were seeing back then, it was script kitties and, you know, you had controlled access. And then, you know, if you leap forward every seven years and look at the exponential changes that are happening across industry and then supply chain and in individual organizations, by, you know, 2007, everything was mobile and, you know, Apple was pumping out products and getting us all connected and through 3G and, you know, Facebook, and it was a, it was a more sophisticated criminal ecosystem out there that was operating, you know, with wide access, you know, wide area networks. And it was much more about being disruptive. And then by 2014, we were talking about the IOT internet thing of things and applications are agile at this point. And you've got 4G, you've got all these different applications that are now coming about. And 
the tone of the the protection was more about protecting hybrid cloud environments and and the goal was destruction. So if you look at some of the attacks, they weren't just about financial gain, they were also about creating disruption and and breaking stuff and causing as much damage as possible. And then if you fast forward to 2021, everyone went home. And so now what you used to have as an attack surface being your organization and being, you know, my dogs are going crazy in the background. Can you yeah, hear that? Okay. I love it. <laughs> uh, um, so then you had the advent of, you know, TikTok and Instagram and a zillion applications out there and everything is code level, right? And now you have no perimeter. You have users that have left the building and are touching everything and for the most part have not become much more sophisticated, right? So in terms of the surface that you have to protect as a leader, it is a very different discourse today than it used to be. And one of the things that I think we should talk about is the changing business models as well. Right. What used to be a protected environment that you had dominion over is now a wide open environment and you're borrowing and lending and you're renting technology. You know, if you think about the difference between buying hardware and shipping it and having it in your hands versus signing up for a service that's continuous and is integrated into other services that have access to big data it's a it's a very very different problem today. It's bizarre, and so it's, it's weird. totally weird. I mean, you you just sit there and said, you know, oh, shipping equipment. I'm thinking, wow, that sounds like the dark ages, right? Do people still buy and sell servers, as an example, right? And anyway, fascinating. Continue. So one of the things that really has emerged as aside from ransomware, um, which, by the way, I don't know if you saw that, but a ransomware attacker got 20 years. In prison. Whoa, when, oh, why? That was announced today. No kidding. Which is kind of amazing because it's a very heavy sentence, but I think it speaks to the sentiment, you know, behind how everyone feels about ransomware. It's basically siphoned off, you know, 10 to 20% of GDP in many countries and is a pernicious problem that has almost broken the entire insurance industry itself. And it's, um, you can't underscore the the rel- relative, you know, challenges associated with that. No, absolutely. And I mean, ransomware is such a huge thing now, obviously. I mean, it's in my my opinion, at a very high level, cryptocurrency helped to simplify the monetization of these types of tax. And then you have these infrastructures provided by criminal networks. And it has dramatically impacted the industry. Like you mentioned, the insurance industry. And now it's difficult for companies to get insurance in some cases. So Wow, I didn't know that. That's amazing. 20 years. That seems, it just it, to your point exactly, that's definitely the sentiment of the industry out there right now. Definitely the, the sentiment. So, yeah, amazing. Yeah, so in terms of when we think of how to solve some of these problems, and, and I have watched customers over the last, you know, 20, 25 years have problems that they needed to solve in different ways, right? So, there was too much access to systems. And so we created, you know, process around that. We had fairly centralized, you know, um, Windows based Active Directory that was sort of the, the linchpin of all of your security programs. You had a firewall. And then, you know, with the advent of alerting systems and a lot of the newer advanced persistent threats coming about, you had to develop a SIM methodology. And so then a proliferation of tools were acquired to, you know, really protect your environment from the inside out and the outside in. And a lot of policies were developed, you know, for internal use as well as for um, accessing, you know, the internet as people started using it more and more. And over time, what's happened is that SIM then became too much alert, too much noise, too much fatigue. I would say that all of the tools that were purchased, first it was products that were purchased and then a lot of tools to combat the the volume challenge. And so getting to the people problem that we have today, the next thing is there was a lot of investment made. You know, if you read the Momentum Cyber Reports, there are some amazing, you know, and, and fantastic evolution in 
you know, the, the level of technology that's available today versus what used to be available. And some really exciting new technologies are emerging every day. Mostly today, I would say around big data and data related security problems, right? Privacy and data. What is interesting though is that we went from having this on-prem to hybrid cloud. A lot of applications moved to the cloud. We then ended up with a SIM SOAR. We then ended up with a strategy around how to protect your users. And today what you have is a lot of services available in the cloud that are intended to protect your environment from end to end, right? And so the, the problem is how do you get control over that broad of a number of assets and people and systems and users and, you know, how many cloud expert team members do you really have? with everything moving to the cloud. So let's, let's dive into that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I mean, I, and I would add to that one, I thought something, I mean, everything you said was amazing. And I, I would highlight your point about it went from technology to tools to manage the technology. So we're getting more layers of abstraction, just trying to get a handle on all these kind of components. And now, you, you know, of course, talk about cloud and what I find interesting, and maybe you agree with this is there's people are using, like you said, hybrid, it's becoming multiple and trying to find a cyber thread that can cross over all these different environments, whether it be hybrid or blended or mixed in some way, shape or form. And so this massive rush to the cloud, massive focus on digital transformation, big data specifically like you mentioned, the, the, and then if I may be so bold to add to that, the massive growth in threat capability and threat impact, even at low level stuff, you, know, you mentioned earlier, not that much more sophisticated. It's just they have, we're just we're, we have more weaknesses across this ecosystem, right? So. To that point is let's let's go a little bit deeper into the business model piece of it because I'm very interested in the business side of how cyber is trying to catch up with it, how certain decisions are made. So let me frame that for a second. Is I think a lot of folks in cyber kind of see cyber as the center of the universe when in reality business is the center of the universe. And then, you know, cyber is just one of the many satellites orbiting their decisions around business and risk and so forth. So what do you think are some of the most critical dynamics when you're advising organizations around business models? How are you pulling in that orbit, that satellite of cyber into those decision-making processes? Yeah, I mean, when you think about the board needing to have more visibility on what's going on in, in security and the mission criticality of cybersecurity now, as opposed to a few years ago, it was always mission critical, but now it's apparent that it's mission critical at the board level, right? It used to only be at the executive levels. And, you know, the, the role of the CISO has changed enormously in the last few years because originally it was technologists primarily who really understood how systems operated, how applications were built. They, you know, designed policy around known and unknown and what the current prevailing, you know, um, standards were and what the audit and, you know, compliance requirements were based on their industry. Now, when you think of a, a CISO, they have to be a business leader. They have to protect their own users, their own product. They have to protect their customers, their customers' interests. They have to protect their privacy, their customers' privacy, their vendors' privacy. They have to manage hundreds, hundreds of vendors. I mean, the pile on in terms of the job responsibilities for the CISO function is unprecedented. I mean, the expectations of that function have gotten from, you know, just basically being a really good technologist to now having to be able to describe with great accuracy, the level of risk, the business, you know, the business challenges and not be the department of no and also be in a position where you can be a business and, and growth um, vehicle. Do you, think the, right? do you think the CISO environment, sorry to interrupt, but do you think the CISO no. community and people aspiring to be CISOs are making that shift in trajectory? Because we still call it cybersecurity. You know, we still say CISOs need more, you know, exposure to higher levels, like boards, stuff like that. But the board and the business leaders are saying, I need more visibility from a risk perspective. Do you feel that, that community is making a sh is making the shift from the technologist to risk based conversations at the business level. One hundred percent, and you're also seeing 
new emerging functions within the security group, right? So you're seeing more chief security officer roles. You're seeing chief legal, um, chief policy officers. You know, there's new emerging functions, um, trust in privacy, you know, or trust in safety. Um, privacy and, and, you know, data security are, are becoming their own, you know, elements within the security group. I would also say that there are elements of security that will, you know, DevOps that may end up in engineering or other, because it's too much, you know, you, you have to be able to know what's going on and then interpret it for the board so that the board can then invest and make decisions on the basis of what's actually happening. And getting real time information out of any systems is pretty challenging. I think it's, um, it's, it's probably the reason why we bring in, you know, the PWCs of the world and, you know, the Mandiants of the world is to get real time information. Um, and, and I think that's actually one of the good thing that's a good things that's emerging from this new cloud movement is the ability to get insights, right? You can, you can see everything much faster. And the question is then, how do you see across multiple clouds? Yes. Um, and the tools are getting much better, I, by the way. I mean, the tools are getting really, really, really getting really good. good. I mean, I think we, yeah. back in the early days, as you know, this was, is cyber sort of relied on e-discovery in some cases as the basis for drawing out, you know, information, classification, and evaluation. And I think the cloud community, the providers are now really embracing that. But again, it gets us back to, in some ways, it's yet another tool to help us manage the technology. Um, it's, do you, gosh, I feel like I'm going all over the place, but while we're on the topic of cross cloud management, just to quickly stop there is, do you see an evolution of solutions around synthesizing cloud visibility or do you see cloud providers or standards organizations like ISO or NIST beginning to, to really dig into that? What do you see as the future of that piece of it? I do see a change when you look at the companies that have grown really fast, like Snowflake, you'll see that they're now deeply investing in security. So their team sees this as a mission critical element of growing not just their, their customers best interests, you know, and, and growing their business, but then also in terms of helping the industry. Um, and then you would also look at how companies that are helping, you know, developers are, are typically across multiple clouds, right? So you have HashiCorp, for example, and, and some of these others that have, you know, cross, um, <clears throat> cross industry and cross cloud developed solutions. Sounds like a great scenario for sort of almost like a centralized cloud broker almost, right? I mean, I know I'm getting close to CASB and some of the things that you mentioned earlier, but um, you know, kind of getting back to that one throat to choke from a cloud perspective, because the different services are becoming so uh, disparate. How do you, as an organization, you're looking at business model, you mentioned, especially at that senior level, like, uh, and I saw recently about like chief trust officer, I think I saw you, you were mentioning at one point. So you mentioned a lot of like data and so forth. How do you see that translating down? Because if I take a step back and I look at, you know, information and cybersecurity, I see so much specialization. I see so many, you mentioned earlier, hundreds of difference of challenges and people who are, have chosen cyber as a career. Okay. Maybe early, mid or late in their career, their specialties. I mean, think about this as years ago, we just said, you're a security professional. Now we say you're a threat hunter. You're specific, this specific, that there's a red team, red team, purple team, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. So how do you take this incredibly complex mix of, quite frankly, very important skills that do command their own sort of tower in the security spectrum? And how do you begin to stitch that together in a business? I mean, I know it's a pretty big question, but what are you seeing organizations do when it comes to a high degree of diversity uh, in cyber capability? That really comes down to what industry in, are they in? And also what stage the business is in. Is it in pre-IPO or public? Is it in growth mode? And, you know, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but the, the big difference when you are at the board level is between thinking of security from the vantage point of a growth organization and a growth mindset. Are you acquiring customers? Are people spending time on your platform? How are you measuring with leading indicators, what the market movements are using artificial intelligence, using, you know, market analysis and your own marketing team providing insights 
versus the traditional EBITDA, which is much more about shareholder value and is much more about stabilizing and protecting and controlling and maintaining and managing the business you already have, right? So the, the difference between the two and, you know, SaaS is sitting right there and, and SaaS is the evolution of going from a traditional EBITDA to a growth organization. And many businesses, including Ford Motor, for example, or, you know, BMW just came out with an $18 heated seat a month. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, right. <all> that. <laughs> everyone, everyone is SaaSifying. And, and there's a reason for that because on the one hand, you can meet the demands of your customer in real time. And then the other reason for it is that it obviously creates a recurring revenue stream that allows you to then, and, and SaaS companies, fair enough, got nailed by their multiples being, you know, overvaluated, but that still remains a viable business model for organizations that are looking to evolve and, and get into that growth mindset. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. A lot of it is about growth and changing the way that people think about the customer. Right. So, and that's also fundamental to the internal customer because the IT department has an internal customer. That's the user. The security team has an internal customer, which is their board. It's their IT department. It's their users. And it's also their external customers. Right. So they have a much broader number of constituencies to service. And when, you know, I talk to CISOs about up leveling their game. A big part of it is also making it so that they can attract people to come in and work in their organization from new places that have a new growth mindset, that have new set of experiences. Maybe they're, you know, a newer generation um, that it, it, that's more fresh out of college. And so how do you attract those folks who are super, super talented, grew up with technology, speak through technology and are perfectly versatile? Right. They, they have a level of understanding of how technology operates that no one ever had mm-hmm. before because they didn't grow up with Amazing. it. Amazing. That's an excellent question. I mean, how, how do you identify? Because um, I think in some cases, the process of trying to identify people, and I see it to this day, is do you have the certification? Do you know this technology? And I'm thinking that's so 90s, right? It's so old. Yeah. Is we need a broader way of thinking about this problem. I mean, we just, uh, earlier we spoke uh, at the beginning of the show and we we're saying, wow, things are getting really complicated. You gave a quick history lesson, you know, from the early, from late nineties to now and threats are getting worse. Technology is getting more complicated, all the things we talked about. So we, and we're, and things are not getting better. They're getting worse, right? So clearly <laughs> as a security community, we've got some areas we can improve, right? So how do we improve our approaches to things. I mean, I'm not saying what we do is not good. I'm just saying is, are we really embracing all the diversity and and approaches and and views that we need to take advantage of, right? So how do we move past the, do you have the certification and, and this technology experience and move beyond or move to expand that perspective to your point exactly? It's about thinking differently at the executive level. It starts with hiring leaders that have a more open mindset in terms of what does a good team member, you know, what's, what constitutes a good team member and what used to be, you know, a leader is very different than what is a leader today, right? In terms of you can lead people, you can lead change management, you can create policy, you can be a legal expert and be a diverse candidate, which didn't used to be the case. It used to be that it was a very traditional sort of, I'd say monochromatic looking team, leadership team. And so what that had the effect of doing is giving a partial view into your talent pool and also your customer, one hundred percent, right? your customer base. 100%. And so I'm really excited to see some of the newer leaders that are emerging because they have a strong voice and because they have a difference of opinion about how things should be. And also because they're able to attract a whole new set of talent. And I'm seeing this in, you know, boards. I'm seeing this in a lot of the, um, the Deloitte's McKinsey's, the big audit firms are bringing in, you know, very, very talented folks from a wide variety of backgrounds. And also because the world is now remote, you can hire people that have wonderful skills and talent And don't necessarily need to be a tremendous presenter. I think that element of social dynamic has shifted since the pandemic in terms of you can be really good at your job 
and not have to stand in front of hundreds of people to deliver a message. You don't have to be in a, in a room full of people and, you know, be convincing and compelling. You can be very good at your job and be a good leader without having to win socially. That's amazing. And I never thought of it that way. I mean, we talk a lot about the effects of essentially COVID accelerating the work from home sort of model. And I think there's a lot of different impressions, but when we think about it, opening up opportunities because of the acceptance of having that interaction and people are very accepting, you know, whether it be, you know, views or, you know, literally like noise or dealing with things on a personal level while you're in a meeting, these things just don't have the effect they used to. I mean, not too long ago was, you know, how well you looked in a suit and tie kind of thing, you know, and, 100%. and now it's, it's all about empathy and qualities of leadership and connecting with people. And, but for me, the big one I just keep standing by is we have to have diversity of thought. We have to start looking at things differently from a different perspective. And I think no matter who it is and what the situation is, we have to find every opportunity to capture how people are viewing the world, especially in cybersecurity, because that's what the threats are doing, right? They, they don't have lines in the sand. They don't have this problem. They're just working all together under, you know, pseudonyms, let's say, right? And uh, they're, they're kicking our butt, to put it mildly, right? Yeah, I would, I would add to that, that you used to have to know how the technology operated, how your IT systems were built, how, you know, speeds and flows worked. Now you, the, the, now the new leaders are knowledgeable about how, how clouds function. And the world is much less permeant, permanent and, and it's much more porous. So you have to think about business enablement first and foremost. So you have to be able to be open to new applications coming in and being, you know, serving a specific purpose. And you don't have to make as much of a business case in order to bring in new technology, which is, it's a refreshing perspective because it allows the average user and the average, you know, analyst and, and team member to be able to add value just by sourcing really cool new technology to solve big problems. And also the cloud technologies are so much faster to ad adopt and to manage and to run. You don't have to think so much about how do you re-architect your environment to serve a new technology that you're bringing in. That has completely shifted the paradigm. And so the vendors are now having to learn the customer's environment first and then build a technology around how the, that environment was created. And so given the fact that in large enterprise, a lot of it is custom built, that means you have to then have a technology that is much more adaptable. Just like your people have to be adaptable, so does your technology. 100%. And I think it, it also has created this feeling of greater willingness to explore experimentation in the technology space. And I believe also is, and if I may be so bold, is I think more people these days, especially young people, young leaders, they're more willing, they're more open to failure because they know that they can fail fast and correct and move forward and matching experimentation with innovation with willingness to fail and move to the next thing. Because, you know, I grew up in a world where you installed an operating system in an application and it didn't change unless you updated it, right? Now it's like things just update automatically and things just happen and it's constantly changing. Things are always on the move. Um, and certainly my generation is like, okay, I guess that, but new generation, that's totally expected. So if something didn't update automatically, they'd be worried, right? And so flexibility, quick to move and quick to adjust is creating a whole different dynamic in the technology space, as well as you mentioned this earlier within the business space concerning, you know, growth, uh, tackling competitors and customers in different ways and new innovative ways. Um, I, I want to come back a little bit to the business model piece. The point you made about whether you're an EBITDA or sort of growth, do you sense that everything is shifting more to driving that growth and around, because I hear, we, we hear a lot about innovation and adopting technology and making things move forward. And you mentioned, well, it depends on what kind of business. Do you sense that this is happening? Is there a consistent theme? Like you mentioned BMW, so much now seems to be moving toward that subscription philosophy. Is that kind of the trend you're seeing and how does that tie into some of the things we've talked about already? Do you sense that the subscription concept is going to be the way we do things in five years and that's going to accelerate and even in 
drive more emphasis on changes, more rapid changes and innovation within the technology space? Yeah, I would absolutely say that that is going to continue. And if you think about the evolution of contracts from a legal standpoint, right? So the assets that you buy, and if you look at a business and analyze it from an M&A perspective, what do you own, right? And what kinds of future business do you have and how do you evaluate that? So when you think about how contracts evolved, you used to buy property. It was intellectual, but it was property. So you were negotiating property rights. You then went to a rental model where you're now talking about how often are you going to lease? How often are you going to sign up for a service, right? And that has now evolved into a consumption-based model. So that you're not just paying for access to the technology and the use of the technology, you're only paying for as much of the technology as you're using in real time. So what that means is that at a regulatory level, policy has also shifted because if everyone is doing a rental model, then someone has to be looking out for every man, every person, every customer. And that's where a lot of these regulations are coming in is realizing that people have now become the target and the product and that our wallet and equals our mind share our, our wallet share equals our mind share so what that ends up doing is shifting the paradigm and the onus of responsibility from each individual corporation to the state to the federal or to the country level so Many organizations that had originally built their systems and designed their businesses and their business models around a global model have now had to shift to create a regionalized, not even regionalized, localized model to satisfy the needs of the policy for that region. So as businesses had originally expanded and grown, now you are seeing this fractionalization and regionalization, which I think will be a really interesting evolution. That's one to watch, right? In terms of how do businesses react? Do they just fold and become US only? Do they fold and become EMEA only? I think that's an evolution that will determine and drive a lot of the innovation as well. It's amazing. I Because every even though the internet is sort of, you know, borderless, we still see different governments, as you say, kind of addressing these kind of business challenges and regulatory issues in different ways. So I think, uh, wow, there's just so much, and, and I want to be sensitive to your time, but if we may talk a little bit about the work that you're doing, if I may, about women in cyber if, for a few minutes, I, I just really want to talk to you about that because it's it's something that I feel is very important and passionate about. You've done some amazing work in that space. Um, tell me a little bit about Forte and, and, and a little about what that organization is doing and some of the other things that you're working on in that space. Yeah, thank you. It's been a labor of love and also really fun. We started this uh, group during the just before the pandemic, actually. So it was literally RSA just before the pandemic hit, right? Their first couple cases were at that RSA and uh, then the doors shuttered. And what we had decided to do was do a meetup with women because there were at the time about 4% leaders. Wow in cybersecurity as women, which means it was great. You know, every time you met a woman, it was a high five. <laughs> like, hey, you're here too. Cool. Another another Martian um, on Earth. This is great. So um, what we decided was let's get together on a regular basis. Let's meet for a variety of purposes. And it's really evolved into a social networking opportunity, as well as we've we've built an advisory group to talk about industry dynamics and, and stay educated and stay close to all of the rapidly changing, you know, dynamics out there in the market. And then we decided to form a board. And the reason for that was because it allows us to take in sponsors who believe strongly that, you know, that women should be in positions of leadership in cybersecurity. And we also wanted to give a voice to the female leader so that, for example, we don't get invited to a lot of technical talks. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Not as many. And so the perception that ends up being women may not be as technical. Oh, man. And then when they are technical, then, you know, and, and this is very common for our industry too, which is trolling. You yeah. know, we, we have some professional trolls in our industry who, who understandably are critical thinkers by nature, 
right? We're all sort of paranoid by nature. We just, that we're, it's a professional deformation. We just think that way, right? How could things go wrong? How could someone get in? So in terms of allowing a voice, we created this group largely so that we would have panelists available to serve in a multitude of different functions, right? Whether it's serving on a board, serving on a panel, creating a white paper. I mean, we have some amazing industry leaders in this group and we've seen them get on boards. We've seen them get access to new opportunities and, and it's a place to go and celebrate. That's amazing. Because yeah, it. it's so fun to have a group where you can post something and literally everyone in the group will pile on in a positive way. It's so nice. <laughs> that is so nice and a little bit rare these days. I like to see the positive nature. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask another question in a little bit. I hope it's not coming out of left field, but what's the next step? How do we create what is, what is that plan for bringing more women into cyber at all levels and then finding ways of elevating that? So you've created this organization. It's quite a few people now. I think over 100. Is that, is that a fair statement? We're close to 100, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's amazing. So how are you – what is your – plan for pulling more women into that? What's your plan for outreach programs to connecting with women? In, in the I'm very curious. There are a number of things happening. The group's function is more to provide thought leadership. However, what I'm seeing also is that we're able to amplify the message for Girls Who Code, for the Grace Hopper Institute, for, you know, all of these other, you know, peripheral organizations that have a vested interest in, in bringing in new new members, new leaders, you know, new voices. Um, I will say also that it's an opportunity for people of color who also have largely been left out of the conversation. And so we're looking for diversity across the board. And um, what I'm seeing is there's a, a threat, um, or sorry, no, it's uh, Thrive TX uh, for Transformation TX. They are offering a whole new curriculum of cybersecurity that's being adopted by, I want to say 50 universities as a core curriculum. So changing at the university level, big deal, steering people's, you know, path from the original, the origination of their career, right? Where do they choose to go to school and what kinds of programs do those universities offer? And then I'm seeing alliance and partnerships from investors to, you know, their institutional investors. I'm seeing, um, all kinds of new technologies that are emerging that make it easier to learn. There's a lot of sharing that goes on. There's a ton of open source. So you see these mentoring models, you see, and you know, folks that are deeply invested in bringing in a new generation of cyber and cyber specialists in certain domains. So with automation, that also makes it less painful to be a SOC analyst or to be, you know, a security practitioner because you don't have to sit there with your eyes looking at a screen all day. You can actually do things and research and, and have a more interesting job. Absolutely. Hopefully we'll automate a lot of that stuff out so people can can move through. And and to that point is just to highlight your point about education and, and building broader programs is uh, we're recording this in October, which is Security Awareness Month. And a lot of discussions about how do we build a better society around cyber because so much of it, so much of cyber is given a new avenue to different types of or historical criminals that are taking advantage of that. So I just wanted to point out that it's great that you're working and you're, you're working amongst a community of people who focus on diversity and it's finding its way into college programs, it's finding its way into early education because that's the only way really it's going to get better. And like we said earlier, That's you can right. rely on technology until you're purple in the face, which is important. I'm not saying it's not important, but the point you made about leadership and how it's changing and, and leveraging the, the new generation and building a better society around cyber to help elevate and kind of fend off these criminal uh, issues, it's we're all going to be better for it. So, but I, I think, um, I think everything that you're doing in this space is amazing. Honestly, when we first started, before we started to hit record button for the audience, is uh, I was like, oh my gosh, there's like literally so much we could talk about. But I'm so glad that we were able to focus on these different elements. I learned a great deal. I can't begin to thank you enough, Didi. It's been amazing. Likewise. Thank you so much. I'm very passionate about all this and really appreciate the time and the energy and, and the podcast that you're doing. This is a, a really fun thing and I appreciate it a lot. Thank you again so very much. And uh, to all of my listeners, thank you for listening. And I'll see you next time on Security Bites.